I'm a big fan of Persian cuisine, which in this case happens to be a sultani kebab with rice and a cooked tomato and salad, which also comes with a skewer of marinated steak and usually a skewer of ground beef, which I had replaced with chicken instead. I highly recommend you try this dish at least once in an Iranian restaurant if you get the chance. You can thank me later. That said, today's episode takes us to beautiful southern Germany, and the quaint little town we're hovering over is called Munderkingen, founded in 1260 by the lords of Emmerkingen, and became a possession of the Dukes of Austria in the 1280s, and the city remained Austrian until 1805. It is situated on the banks of the Danube River with its own medieval city center, where people gather to socialize and have festivals. Today, the citizens are gathered around the town's historic fountain. And while it may be a bit difficult to see from this angle, if you look closely, you'll notice that there's a lion sitting on top with its back to us. But you can still make out its mane. I can't say for certain, but I suspect that if it were facing us, it would probably have its tongue out, which is the typical way the lion symbol is featured, such as on the city's oldest seal which dates back to 1289 and depicts the lion and the six-pointed star, which some call the Star of David and others call the Seal of Solomon, which is prominent in medieval Arabic tradition from which it developed in Islamic and Jewish mysticism and in Western occultism. <laughs> Of course, the lion is not native to Germany, and like the six-pointed star, can trace its origins to North Africa, which was once dominated by the Phoenicians, including places like Ethiopia, which in biblical times, as is the case with most places, was ruled by a different demographic than one finds in modern times. This goes for all of North Africa, from Morocco to Egypt, from India to Iran, and China and Eurasia. Civilizations are frail and unstable, they do not endure, and the people who once ruled the Mediterranean made their way into Europe and through secretive organizations such as the Knights Templar, the Rosicrucians, and Freemasons maintained the ancient occult esoteric traditions from places like the Middle East, Levant, and North Africa in medieval Europe in what was most popularly known as alchemy. Which brings us back to Munderkingen and what is famously known as the treasure hoard of Munderkingen, which was found in 1985 and dates back to the 3rd century AD, when the population living in the area of what is now southwest Germany buried the most valuable goods in the hope of retrieving them after Germanic attacks. But this was often in vain, as was likely the case here with the hoard consisting of two bronze statuettes of mercury, a bowl, a candlestick, and the fittings of a wooden chest. Of course, mercury plays a special role in alchemy, and while it's not the scope of this presentation, so does the lion, as the Munderkingen seal, which actually belonged to the Habsburg family. 
The House of Habsburg, or House of Austria, was one of the most prominent royal houses of Europe in the second millennium. Its power base was in Vienna, where the Habsburgs ruled until 1918. The throne of the Holy Roman Empire was continuously occupied by the Habsburgs from 1440 until their extinction in the male line in 1806. The house also produced kings of Bohemia, Hungary, Croatia, Spain, Portugal, with their respective colonies, and in the 19th century, emperors of Austria and Austria-Hungary, as well as one emperor of Mexico. The progenitor of the House of Habsburg was Guntram the Rich, a count in southwest Germany between the Rhine River and the foothills of the Black Forest, who lived in the 10th century, and before him, Adelrich, Duke of Alsace, and the founder of the family of Edekinent, and an important and an influential figure in the power politic of the late 7th century in the northeastern section of the Merovingian kingdom of the Franks. The Atikinids were an important noble family, probably of Frankish, Burgundian, or Visigoth origin. The Burgundians were an early Germanic tribe in the Rhine region, and in the time of the Roman Empire, lived in part of the region of Germania that is now part of Poland. The Visigoths were an early Germanic people who invaded the Roman Empire between the 3rd and 5th centuries AD and ruled much of Spain until overthrown by the Moors in 711. And the Franks were a group of Germanic people whose name was first mentioned in the 3rd century in Roman sources and associated with tribes between the Lower Rhine and the Ems River on the edge of the Roman Empire. So to keep it simple, the enemies of the early Roman Empire that eventually conquered it came from Northern Europe and Scandinavia and specifically Sweden. Several North Germanic tribes are mentioned by classical writers in antiquity, particularly the Goths, Danes, and Swedes. The first author who wrote about them is Tacitus in his Germania in 98 AD. And according to other early sources, such as the Norse king sagas, the Swedes were a powerful tribe whose kings claimed descendants from the god Freyr. A subset of these Norsemen, called Varangians, also known as the Rus, traveled eastward into what is now Russia. For centuries, the lion has been an important element in the Swedish coat of arms, and most European monarchies have the same kind of lion in their coat of arms, with the tongue sticking out, which is reminiscent of the Indian goddess Kali, who has her tongue out as well. I've already mentioned that all European royal families share genetic affinities, as well as are overwhelmingly RH negative blood factor. It could be speculated that it's an early Christian symbol, but like many traditional aspects of Christianity, like the Christmas tree, there's an earlier precedent. The lion also appears with the griffin, which at this point can start to be associated with the Scythians, who were an ancient Iranian or Aryan tribes that entered Europe in several waves, introducing new technologies like advanced metals and livestock like horses and cattle from Anatolia and the Middle East. The Scythian nobility were fond of the swastika symbol, which was in use universally when the old world Aryan order wielded power and influence. And the same symbol can be found etched in Germanic spears, as the term German literally means spearmen. Ger means spear, and man means just that, man. The spear or lance, together with the bow, the sword, and the shield, were the main equipment of the Germanic warriors during the migration period and the early Middle Ages. Of course, I've already discussed how there was ancient transatlantic contact with the New World. And before World War II, we find road signs in Arizona 
with Clovis spear tips that also have the swastika etched in them. Clovis is a name used in the Americas, and the European Pleistocene term is called Solutrian, and they're nearly identical. Some researchers have postulated that the Iranian Scythians were at least in part mixed with what are popularly known as Israelite tribes, which moved up from ancient Phoenicia, or Israel, which once had a city called Scythopolis that was burned down, but artifacts have survived, such as this stone relief of a lion fighting a dog. The Phoenician alphabet is almost identical to Old Hebrew, and the languages spoken by certain groups who are traditionally associated with Scythians, such as the Ashkenazi Jews that speak Yiddish, seems to be a hybrid between High German, which is an Indo-European language, and Hebrew, which is Semitic. The term Semitic comes from Sem, a son of Noah, and is a language group, not a race. I maintain that the three sons of Noah all represent Caucasian phenotypes, ethnically speaking, where the offspring of Ham, who are the Canaanites or Phoenicians, and the offspring of Japheth, who are the Aryans or Indo-European populations, are also Caucasian, with the primary differences being linguistic, not genetic, until much later as a result of mixing, or in some cases, inbreeding, which seems to have been an issue amongst the Habsburgs, who, likely in an effort to consolidate power, married amongst their own family, passing on certain genetic markers, such as the distinctive Habsburg jaw, which is a mandibular prognathism, meaning the mouth sticks out from the face, and a thick lower lip and prominent nose. While some Europeans get offended at the suggestion that people from the Middle East, particularly affiliated with Israelites, could have influenced early Europe, there's no doubt that waves of horsemen penetrated into Europe from the steppes, which extends all the way to Mongolia, and as people migrated westward from the Far East, the Iranic or Aryan tribes around the Black Sea did the same. This is evident in linguistic influences of the European languages, in the livestock and tool technology, in the genetics of the people, which has come out during the last decade and is really irrefutable, and in the esoteric practices that are guarded by secret societies that practice the same or similar types of tantric rituals, which are more openly on display in Eurasian and Eastern civilizations, which were also influenced by the early Aryans, from India to China and Tibet. While some would argue that Christianity, Judaism, and Islam have nothing to do with Tantra, keep in mind that there are esoteric interpretations of these religions as well, such as Sufism, Kabbalistic Judaic mysticism, and esoteric versions of Christianity, even among sects such as the Mormons, which can all be traced back to Phoenician and Aryan alchemical practices which were forced underground and today are referred to as sex magic, divination, and the occult. Of course, there's more to it than that, as these organizations, many of whom were set up to guard certain knowledge and bloodlines, seem to have been infiltrated and are now political tools of the very agendas that they were originally set up to combat. In closing, let us now listen to a brief statement made by the living descendant of the dethroned Habsburg lineage, Prince George von Habsburg Lothringen, promoting the Kalergi plan. Count Kalergi was a founding father of the European Union and argued for forced multiculturalism in Europe in an effort to eradicate ethnic, cultural, and racial identity to make the European people easier to subdue and control. Of course, this is promoted as a solution to wars 
all of which were financed and engineered by the same new order that offers their own centrally controlled peace. But there was already in 1923 a movement, or let's better say a gentleman called Richard Kudnov Kalergi, who started the so-called pan-European movement. This was the first European unification movement. He was a very interesting personality because um, his father was a diplomat of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He was basically from Bohemia. His mother was Japanese, so that was also a very interesting cultural influence on him. And he was saying, he was seeing what, let's say, broke together in um, uh, when the First World War was over. He was foreseeing what happened if nationalists would take over and nationalist movie, uh, movements would enter uh, into Europe and would create so many trouble that the next war would be inevitable. And so he started this pan-European movement, but unfortunately he didn't have the possibility to really raise enough interest that the politicians were convinced that you had to unite Europe. And so it was only after the Second World War that people remembered what were these ideas of uh, well, having in mind the horrors the Second World War was presenting to them, that they were really coming back to these ideas and they said we have to think about what to do, that we're not going to go into another world war or into another bigger crisis. And um, they started to come back to the ideas of this pan-European movement and to think about how to build this unity of Europe. Um, of course, it was very complicated, you know, the, the, the communist countries, and it could only be stopped on the on the ruins of the of the Second World War. So it was first, you know, the the Union for Coal and Steel that was built, but it needed some very famous politicians really to make this European Union start working. And there was in France the General Charles de Gaulle and in Germany the Chancellor uh, Adenauer, who were really taking the initiative of taking up the ideas to work on the unification of Europe. The Calergi plan by Count Calergi. Count Calergi devised this plan whereby he wants to destroy the ethnicity of every European. He wants uh, Europe to not have anymore their own single ethnicity. And that's why they're pushing all these immigrants to uh, cross uh, the Mediterranean and come into Europe. They are basically destroying Europe by doing that. Um, we don't have anything uh, racistic against anyone, of course, but what they're doing is completely uh, criminal. And they're actually financing these people once they come to Italy. They have more rights than the Italians. They give them houses, they give them hotels, they even give them 30 euro a day so they can uh, buy and pay for the mobile phones for their things. I mean, they're treated better. There is no social security here in Italy, but still, these immigrants have everything. So Italians are, of course, getting more and more mad every day. And this is all because of the Calergi plan to destroy the ethnicity of Europeans. <laughs> My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon, as well as through various other major book outlets. They make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you could do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those that are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your comments. So please leave me your thoughts below. Please have a wonderful weekend and I hope to see you again soon.